Thank you, General Lady. Madam Secretary, they've called votes, but we're going to try to get in. Uh, Mr. Roskam, and I'm going to recognize Ms. Brooks for 10 seconds before Mr. Roskam. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to clarify for the record, I made a statement previously that we had received none of Under Secretary Patrick Kennedy's emails. We have received some through production of other individuals' emails. We have not received a full production of Under Secretary Patrick Kennedy's emails. So I just wanted to clarify, we do have some, but it, it is through other email production. Thank you. I yield yep. back. Yes, ma'am. General from, uh, from Illinois. Thanks. Uh, Secretary Clinton, can I just direct your attention to the screen? <clears throat> You're familiar with that clip, we came, we saw, he died. Is that the Clinton doctrine? No. That was uh, an expression of relief that uh, uh, the military mission undertaken by NATO and our other partners uh, had achieved its uh, end, and therefore no more uh, American, European, or Arab lives uh, would be at stake in trying to uh, prevent Gaddafi from uh, wreaking havoc uh, on uh, Libyans or causing more problems to the region and beyond. I want to direct your attention and maybe direct the group's attention right now to something that, that hasn't really been discussed. There's been this explicit criticism of Republicans um, being partisans today, but I want to direct your attention to what is actually going on with you and your team, many of whom were, are here today with you. So Jake Sullivan, one of your close advisors that you just told us about, put together the TikTok on Libya memo, and that was a memo that was all about you. It put together 22 different accomplishments, and you were the central figure in all 22 of those accomplishments. And I've got to tell you, it's really well put together. He uses language of action and initiative and leadership. Let me just give you a couple of these. HRC, that's you obviously, announces directs, appoints special envoy, travels to G8, secures Russian abstention, secures transi transition of command and control, travels to Berlin, Rome, Abu Dhabi, Istanbul. He's basically laying the foundation that the Libya policy is your policy. Essentially, he's making the argument that it's your baby. And you are clearly familiar with this timeline because in email exchanges with your senior staff, you were not happy about it. And the part that you weren't happy about wasn't that you were the focal point, is that it didn't include enough. So you said, this is your email. What bothers me is that the policy office prepared the timeline, but it doesn't include much of what I did. Another time you said, the timeline is totally inadequate, which bothers me about our record keeping. And I'll come back to that in a minute, Secretary. For example, I was in Paris in 319 when the attack started. It's not on the timeline. What else is missing? Go over as soon as possible. Now, this timeline was put together, according to your senior staff, explicitly for an article that came out in the Washington Post entitled, Clinton's Key Role in Libya Conflict. And in fact, according to your staff, quote, the comprehensive TikTok memo Jake had put together was done in large part for the Warwick piece. It was a piece written by Joby Warwick at the Washington Post. And again, according to your staff, the great detail Joby had came entirely from Jake. That's Jake Sullivan. Joby didn't do any independent research. That's according to your staff. Now, this article, it's one of these articles that you read a couple of times it's in a, if, it, if it's about you. Here are some expert, excerpts. Washington Post. A foreign policy success for the Obama administration and its most famous cabinet minister, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Or this, she went to Paris, there were no instructions from the White House on whether to support strong action in Libya, said a senior State Department official. Yet within three days, the official said, Clinton began to see a way forward. And I think my, my personal favorite is this, Clinton, ignoring the advice of State Department lawyers, convinced Obama to grant full diplomatic recognition to the rebels. Now, you and your team were pleased with the work that you did and the risks that you took, the leadership that you took. A couple, you know, a couple of hours ago, you told me, hey, I'm the diplomat here. I'm driving the policy. And isn't it true that you'd been thinking about getting political credit actually for months on this? No. 
<laughs> well, if that's we your were, answer, we let me were draw trying, your attention, Madam but, Secretary. But Congressman, you, you, you let me please, right, if I could. Enough, we were trying to make sure that what was written, because it's not always accurate, in case you all haven't noticed in your own careers, what was written about a very important uh, foreign policy effort by this administration was accurate. This was all in response, as I understand it, to a reporter trying to ask questions and us providing the best possible information we could. In fact, trying to make sure that we ourselves had a good timeline and that our record keeping was accurate. I, I think that is uh, not an uncommon uh, experience here in Washington. Somebody calls you up, says, I'm writing a story. What can you tell us? And you tell them. Well, Secretary Clinton, that's not all that was going on, though. Isn't that right? Because you knew that this was good for you. Because this is what you were writing in August, uh, August of 2011. This is right after Tripoli fell. You wrote, what about the idea of my flying to Martha's Vineyard to see the president for 30 minutes and then making a statement with him alone? Or you asked your staff how to convince the White House that this would be good for the president. And these are your words, Madam Secretary. It's a great opportunity to describe all that we've been doing before the French try to take all the credit. In fact, your staff told you that they thought it would be a political boost for the president, showing that he was huddling with you instead of being on vacation. And so you asked your chief of staff, Cheryl, or Jake Sullivan asked your chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, to call Dennis McDonough, now the president's chief of staff, to put together a full court press. I'll wait while you read Jake's note. Thank you. Because I don't- Well, here's my question. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm waiting for a question. Well, go ahead. You finish reading and I'll start talking. Well, one thing I wanted, which- well, are, are, since, are, since, are I don't have, since I don't have what you're reading oh, here, in I'll, front it's, of it's me, page, Congressman- it's, it's, it's tab 12. Well, that, that has now been handed to me. And it's clear that I wanted to make sure Chris Stevens, Jeff Feltman, DOD, got credit. I wrote that. You did not quote that. Yeah, but you're, yeah, well, you're, this is all about let, state of mind at that particular point. You were not, you were thinking about credit for you. Isn't that right? No, that's not. I wanted those who were part of this uh, policy to be given uh, recognition. And I also wanted to be sure that uh, we had uh, the, the president uh, and the White House coordinating with us. Uh, it, it was a very gutsy decision for the president to make, Congressman. It was not by any means an easy call. As I alluded earlier this morning, I was in that situation room many, many times, watching the president have to balance competing interests, competing opinions, trying to make a decision. When he made the decision, that the United States would support NATO and support the Arabs, there was no guarantee about how it would turn out. And I personally believe he deserved a lot of credit, as did Chris Stevens, Jeff Feltman, the Department of Defense, and others. We had a daily phone call, a daily secure phone call that often included the president, included you know, the generals, response, the generals and the admirals responsible for our mission, included our top diplomats. This was a very, important and challenging uh, effort that we undertook in large measure to support our NATO allies. So I wanted everybody who had any role in it to be acknowledged. Well, and then on August 2011, um, you received an email from Sidney Blumenthal, that's tab 11, in which he wrote this to you. This is a historic moment and you will be credited for realizing it. When Gaddafi himself is finally removed, you should, of course, make a public statement before the cameras, wherever you are, even in the driveway of your vacation home. You must go on camera. That was Blumenthal's admonishment to you. And I don't recall doing that, just well, in case you're going to ask me. Yeah, but I mean, look, the timing. You forwarded Blumenthal's suggestion to Jake Sullivan. And you were focused on how dramatic it would be. You were working to make this the story of the day. Isn't that right? This is your email to Jake. This is tab 11. This is your words, Madam Secretary. Sid makes a good case for what I should say, but it's premised on being said after Gaddafi goes, which will make it more dramatic. That's my hesitancy, since I'm not sure how many chances I'll get. So two months before the end of the Gaddafi regime, regime, and you're already planning on how to make your statement dramatic to maximize political gains. Isn't that right? Congressman, I 
think that uh, what we were trying to do was to keep the American people informed about this policy. It was, as you recall, um, somewhat controversial. Now, there were Republicans as well as Democrats who advocated for it, and there were Republicans as well as Democrats who were concerned about it. So I think as uh, Secretary of State, I did have an obligation at some point uh, to be part of the public uh, discussion about what uh, had occurred. And I see nothing uh, at all unusual about trying to figure out when would be the best time to do that. Isn't it true that your staff heard from the White House after the Warwick piece in the Washington Post that they were concerned that is the White House of the amount of credit that you were getting as opposed to the amount of credit the president's getting? That's true, isn't it, Madam Secretary? Look, the president deserves the lion's share of the credit. He Why is the White House uptight that you're taking the credit? Well, I was often being asked that. The president had a lot of other stuff going on. He was still trying to, you know, rescue the economy. Uh, a lot of other things happening. So from my perspective, the president deserves the credit. He's the one who made the decision. I was honored to be part of the team that advised him. And insofar as I was able to explain what we had did and what the import of it was, I was ready to do so. So when Jake Sullivan, tab 11, emails you and... Um, said that you wanted, you should publicize this in all of your television appearances. They wanted to quote, have you lay down something definitive, almost like the Clinton doctrine? That wasn't the Obama doctrine. Is that right, Madam Secretary? Well, this I think- This was what, the Clinton doctrine. Well, look, I think that the effort we made, the way we put together the coalition, the way I put together the coalition that uh, imposed sanctions on Iran, I think that there is a lot to talk about. I talked about smart power. You're talking about what I believe. I believe we have to use every tool at our disposal. Lead with diplomacy, support. You are able to find $20 million to support uh, increased security forces in Libya, yet we weren't able to find money to support your own people on the ground. With development and when necessary as a last resort, not a first choice, defense. So, yes, is that what I believe? It is what I believe. And I think that, uh, you know, Libya was to some extent an example of that. And you were the author of the Libya policy. You were the one that drove it. It was your baby. It was an attempt to use smart power. And that's what you tried to do. Isn't that right? It certainly was something that I came to believe was uh, in the interest of the United States to join with our NATO allies and our Arab partners in doing the decision as all decisions in any administration uh, was made by the president. So the president deserves uh, the historic credit, what role I played. I'm very uh, grateful to have had that chance and I'm you know, very convinced that it was the right thing to do. Well, you, you just recited the Clinton Doctrine to us and let me tell you what I think the Clinton Doctrine is. I think it's where an opportunity is seized to turn progress in Libya into a political win for Hillary Rodham Clinton. And at the precise moment when things look good, take a victory lap like on all the Sunday shows three times that year before Gaddafi was killed and then turn your attention to other things. I yield back. Well, Congressman, that is uh, only uh, a political statement which you well understand and I don't understand why that has anything to do with what we are supposed to be talking about today. You are able to find $20 million to support uh, increased security forces in Libya, yet we weren't able to find money to support your own people on the ground. Premises that were vulnerable and threatened, of course they came to me. I had to make the decision.